Or your fine powder. Some of you will recall when I gave my talk uh, several months ago on geocentricity, I entitled the presentation A Biblical Consideration. Okay. And coincidentally enough, you can remember that by ABC. Any subject you have, remember ABC. Consider it biblically, a biblical consideration. So this morning, we are going to have a biblical consideration of fruit of the womb. All right. That will be, we're going to consider it biblically. Simple enough. Some of you may have thought this was coming since we just had a baby. <laughs> Please turn to Genesis 1. We'll be there in a moment. Genesis chapter 1. Now in any society, it's basically assumed that a married couple will attempt to produce children. It's not always demanded, but it's, it's essentially expected. Now where we find difference or discussion is when we ask how many children are to be in each family. Some societies, not ours, but some, have laws in place legislating the number of children in the family. Think of the, the, the problems over in the Orient. How the legislative problems have led to one boy in each family. There's no girls to marry them. And there's a real, there's a real problem there. The Nazis practiced forced sterilization to stop any children. These are simply societies that we have as our examples. Just ask any environmentalist about the effect more children will have on the world's ecosystem, and you'll get an earful. No, don't have any more children. Don't you know? Don't Christian? They don't want anybody, Christians or not. But notice how they don't remove themselves as part of the problem. But you certainly can't have any more children. You should obviously be stopped. That is, we should be stopped from bearing our young. So we can laugh at these ridiculous philosophies, although they've played a major role in history, we can laugh at them concerning procreation, for it's obvious to us that they are false, simply on the surface. But if, they're, if they are false, then where is truth? And today I hope will be a biblical consideration of this topic. So here's a couple of questions to just, just ponder in your mind, don't raise your hand, don't give me an answer, whatever you do, it might be embarrassing. But I'd ask you, in your opinion, how many children should a family have? Very simple question. And every one of us came up with an answer in our minds just then, whether it be 3, 6, 8, 12. Everybody had an answer. Keep the answer in your mind. Don't say it out loud. And I would ask the question, if you've had the opportunity to have children, if the Lord has blessed you with a family, how many children do you have? And now, today primarily, let me just stop and say, today will be a message on procreation, the fruit of the womb, but there is a valid place for those who remain single, uh, for those who remain celibate, there's a valid place for that. Today's sermon is not negating that, and is not speaking negatively of those whose lives is a ministry of, of not being married, um, that sort of thing. So, I'll lay that to rest, I'm not fighting that. There's a place and a blessing for those the Lord has re required to remain single. But very, they, very, very small very number, very small <coughs> number. So today, not negating it, we will be discussing the positive uh, of having a family. So now, uh, if we all have a number, how many should a family have? And I ask you, how many do you have? Is there a difference between what might be your theology versus your practice? <coughs> what is your life lived out? versus your theology. Perhaps your theology has changed since you were young, since you were bearing children, uh, but is there a difference between the one and the other? Your theology, your orthodoxy versus your practice. And I'll ask these questions again uh, towards the end, but what saith the scriptures? If you'll notice, we're going to run right through a bunch of verses, similar to what I did with Geocentricity. I'm going to build my case and see if anybody um, would perhaps care to chop it down, but we'll see it. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. Verse 28, And God blessed them, that is, the man and the woman, and said, God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. Now notice he did not say, perhaps it could be grammatically, here's a little grammatical, Be fruitful and add. 
Now that's 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 a philosophy, perhaps the emphasis there. We are to be fruitful and do something. We are to be fruitful and add to the kingdom. But that's not the, the term we're, we're working with here. Verse 28, God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. There's a great difference between addition versus multiplication. Right. I'm not going to go into it, but boy, if you start running numbers, you can just doubling something. Um, it compounds the number you know, immensely, let alone multiplying it. 5 times 10, 50. 5 times that, 250. You just be multiplying. And so we're, we are called not simply to add to the kingdom by our efforts, by, the, by being fruitful. We are to multiply, just simply the use of the term. Now this verse alone, in verse 20, 28, should be enough for me to build a doctrine just in that. That should be the sermon right there. And just in case you haven't guessed it by now, I will attempt to show the only conclusion you can come to scripturally, again, this is a biblical consideration, this is a scientific consideration, a socialistic consideration, a financial consideration, none of those. This is a biblical consideration, and I say the only conclusion you can come to, wait for me to give you more passages, is to have as many children as the Lord gives you. Now, many might say, but Warren Luke, you're making decisions for your family. Maybe that's right for you, but it's legalistic for you to tell me what I should do or how many children I should have. So let this, let, do not let this be Warren Luke making the rules. Let this be the Word of God speaking to you today as we consider this topic. Hopefully, I will have the Bible do the talking, and the scriptures alone can bring conviction. Genesis chapter 4, over a couple pages, just get ready, we'll be leaping, leaping right through the Bible. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. It wasn't that she had gotten a man from her husband. There is a physicality, there is a natural method of, of how children are conceived. She did not say, thank the Lord, God gave me a man who is able to fulfill this physical need in order to bear children. She says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Make no mistake to answer the question, where do babies come from? <laughs> Eve knew it well. She had, a, she had a close relationship with the Lord before the fall. Eve knew she got her, her son from the Lord, and only from the Lord. Genesis 20, over several chapters. Genesis 20. And you can see I'm not even going to take time to, to work through the verses. Uh, they, they stand on their face, uh, on face value, uh, as being worthy. Genesis 20 and verse 17 and 18. The story of Abimelech when Abraham and Sarah were traveling through uh, of Abimelech. Um, yes, Abimelech um, chose Sarah to be his wife, which was customary. Um, so that way he might marry the family and they would have a good political relationship, as it were. But Sarah was already married to Abraham. So the Lord intervened. Uh, and in verse 17, so Abraham prayed unto God and, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bear children. Verse 18, for the Lord, the Lord himself, had fast closed of all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. The Lord did a, a miraculous work to punish them until the, the situation had been resolved. And it was, and the Lord forgave uh, and gave blessings. But notice 18, for the Lord had fast closed of all the wombs of the house. We think in our, in our society it's put to us that we have the choice when to have children. We have the option how far to space them apart. I say to you, the Lord has it in His mighty hand to close the wombs of ladies, to open the wombs of those whom He would. It is His choice. How dare we presume it's something that, well, I know I can work it out. I'm doing the math every two years. There's, a, there's an appropriate spacing that sort of thing. Who are we to presume of when to open a woman's womb and when we are to close it? So we think we can choose pregnancy. We think we know how to cause it or halt it. 
Medically, physically, we know all about making babies. We've got the physiology, we've got it down. Medically, we know what's available, we know our options. It's our decision. I say to you that is false. Do we know it so well we no longer need God? Do we, do we, yeah, we've got that down, we know all about it. We don't even need God's blessing. In Scripture, Eve knew. Where did her son come? From the Lord himself. Eve was sanctified enough to know where her son came from. Uh, jump back, if you would, to Genesis 16. Just to get back a couple chapters. Genesis 16 and verse 10. Speaking of Hagar. Abraham's uh, concubine, as it were. He's, he's, he took her to wife. Um, Genesis 16, verse 10. And the angel of the Lord, we know this to be the Lord himself, um, appearing uh, to Hagar. Uh, verse 10. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply, or excuse me, He's talking to Sarah. Excuse me. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. He did not command her to multiply. We already had a command that we have a duty and responsibility to multiply. But notice in verse 10, I, that is God speaking, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly. The Lord will bless those whom he chooses. Now, the command from Genesis 1, be fruitful and multiply, is more of a duty is ours, results are God's. Remember the old phrase? Duty is ours, results are God's. We get that duty from, from Genesis chapter 1. But notice in verse 10, our Lord is the one who will faithfully bring that blessing. He will bring the multiplication. He will bring the harvest. In marriage, there is always to be a healthy physical relationship as God designed. That's straight up. We are to be fruitful and multiply. We have a role to play. Let's not forget that. We have a role to play. However, in his providential plan, the proper physical relationship does not always produce children. There are godly men and women who marry young, hoping for a family. And the Lord, in his providence, we, everyone here probably knows a couple that tried for years and simply could not have children. They went to the doctor. They sought help. And they prayed. Every, the whole church has prayed for them. And they could not have children. And, and, and some may never did. Perhaps they were able to adopt. Um, or that sort of thing. We all know it. Having a proper physical relationship does not always you know, result in children being blessed by the Lord. And so imagine choosing not to have children for the first few years of marriage to kind of get their, you know, square away, get their feet, you know, squared away and that sort of thing. And then when, when they decide they're ready to have kids, they get her off birth control or whatever, and perhaps it was, you know, now she can't get pregnant. I don't, you see how we're messing with the Lord's providence in our lives. We presume to be as God. Again, duty is ours, results are God's. In Genesis 16, 10, God speaking through the image of an angel says, I will multiply. Genesis 17, where are we at? Genesis 17, verse 2, a very similar passage. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. Genesis chapter 21, 1 and 2, And the Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Notice the end of verse 1. And the Lord did unto Sarah. Now there was something necessary that Abraham had to do as well. But notice how it came about. The conception, the pregnancy, the blessing of a son came from the Lord. The Lord did. Unto Sarah, I say to you, for every conception that has ever happened requires a holy and wonderful work of our Lord on behalf of the women who bear children. Amen. Now, there's the, now, this was not a, a, um, a conception such as was with Christ. The Holy Spirit did not come upon Sarah, and she did not bear a, a God child of some kind. But the Lord did the work in her life. The Lord has his hand in conception. Let's not get the idea that it's simply about our physicalness. That's wrong. The Lord must be seen, and we give him all the glory and the, the praise for it. The Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Now we know Abraham did something too. Where did Isaac come from? He came from the Lord. Genesis 29. 
Get over a couple, a couple more chapters. Genesis 29, verse 31 and 33. Ah, it, it just it merely more examples throughout Scripture, the history of the, the, the great men and women of faith. Genesis 29, 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. Don't you think Rachel wanted kids? But in the Lord's providence, he closed her womb for a time. Verse 33. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she named his name uh, Simeon. He hath. The Lord hath. Where do babies come from? They from, come from the Lord himself. Uh, Genesis 30, verse 2, probably across the page. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel and said, Am I in God's stead? Who hath withheld thee the fruit of the womb? He's saying, who is ultimately responsible for this? What, what, what's going on? Who is? Um, and he said, Am I in God's stead? Who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? He was recognizing the Lord was the one who had his hand upon her womb, and for that time he did not allow her to have children. Verse 6, And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and hath given me a son. Therefore she called, his, called she his name Dan. Over, if you would, to Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, in this way, I hope you can see, I hope you're not fighting against me this morning, but this is a biblical consideration. Notice the verses. Take them home. I don't believe I'm, I'm pulling them out of their context. They're fairly simple, but I'm building a case. And I hope it's not me adding so much commentary that you're confused, but rather it's simply, we're simply looking at the Bible verses. Sometimes it's necessary to get complicated, to chop things down, but I don't believe it's so in this case. Numbers 11, verse 12. Now here we have Mo, uh, the, the children of Israel in the wilderness complaining to Moses. They're saying, Moses, give us food. We're hungry. Moses was, in essence, the father figure, um, shepherding the, the, the camp of Israel, as it were. And Moses said unto the Lord, oh, excuse me, uh, well, we'll begin in verse 11. Moses said to the Lord, Where, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant, and wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight? All the people are angry at him, saying, God, what have I done, that thou layest the burden of all this people on me? I'm responsible for all these people. Verse 12, Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them, that thou should say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? Moses is basically saying, I didn't, I didn't sire this multitude of people. This responsibility of fatherhood should not be on me. He's basically saying to God, you made them, you feed them. He says, I'm not responsible. I, as in, I didn't create this mass of people. I shouldn't be responsible for them. Lord, these are your children. You feed them, even if you use me as an instrument of your will. So Moses recognized he did not create those people. They came from our Lord and no one else. And we, to, to, amen, that we are the children of God and He does care for us. Deuteronomy 28, verse 11. Deuteronomy 28, verse 11. The, the chapter of blessings. 28, verse 11, And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, that is, plenteous, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. Hey, I want that blessing. By God's grace, yes. give me that blessing. Plenteous in the fruit of of thy body. There's a blessing straight from God Himself that many today in society, even in the church world, would say, ah, I'll hold off on that for the first few years of marriage. We'll wait getting our, you know, our, our financial situation squared away. And then when we choose, we'll then begin receiving that blessing of a family from the Lord. 
the audacity of that kind of thinking, and it permeates the society around us as well as the church in our country. Clearly, children are not the only blessing our Lord gives. That's not, that's not good. This is simply considering there would be a biblical consideration of every other blessing that's available, but today we're talking about the family. And I'll take any blessing I can get. Finally, if you would, Ruth uh, chapter 4. Oh, I probably got a couple more verses. Ruth chapter 4, right before 1 Samuel. And this is getting monotonous, and I'm just building on Scripture, just building it up. So we got you got no excuse from the end of this sermon. I'm not leaving you any hole, no loophole at all. Uh, Ruth 4.13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife, and when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception. Ruth and Boaz had a beautiful married relationship, but the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. Who do we think we are to decide when we have kids, how many we'll have, how far apart will they be, what nonsense, what foolishness. And yet we think we know best. We've got sociologists, we've got medical you know, practitioners that think they know best. 1 Samuel 1, 6 speaks of the Lord closing Hannah's womb. And we all know the story of Hannah finally being given a son. If you would, Ezekiel chapter 16, over quite a bit now, Ezekiel chapter 16. Verse 16 and verse 7, our Lord speaking to Israel, very simply, I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field. And thou have, hast increased and waxen great. I have multiplied thee. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field. Imagine that. How many weeds are out there on the hillsides? Our Lord caused his children to multiply as the bud of the field. May he be gracious enough to give us buds of the field in this land. There's not that many of us out there. We need fields of Christian babies. I'll be honest with you. Children are from God. Now there is a, then we've seen an entire set of verses that anyone has to face. I say you have to face every one of them when deciding how many the children to have if you're yet unmarried uh, or parents training your children up, teaching them how many children should they have. Here's your consideration. When deciding how many children to have, deciding when to have them, deciding on proper spacing. Now, the modern world gives us information about how long between births is optimal. Google it. It's anywhere out there. You can find articles from sociologists, um, psychologists, any of this, in order for the baby to develop properly, for mental growth and stability. But I doubt those articles that you'll find quote these scriptures on the subject. I doubt you're going to find one verse backing up a position to not have a child for any particular reason. I doubt you'll find a verse. You can go with those reasons, but they're not scriptural. The world would tell a young couple, wait two to five years for children. So you can figure out perhaps if this marriage is the one you're really going to stick with. What are they basically telling the kids? You can kind of sleep around for a couple of years, then get an easy divorce, and then find somebody else now that you've kind of gone through those first couple of years where you're chaotic and don't really know what you're doing. The, the, the world outside would tell, don't have children because you don't want to have to, you know, go through the, the divorce and the, you know, the custody battles and that sort of thing. So just wait having children. Basically, they're planning your divorce for you. And then your second marriage, you know, you're, you know, you're a little more squared away, a little more mature emotionally, and then you can start having children. Do you see how common that thought is? Perhaps not in this church, but in the world around us, I say to you, it's prevalent. A woman's health is often used as an excuse. Now, I'm not a woman, so I won't ride this too hard, but my Bible in Exodus 15.26 says, For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now, to the ladies out there, do you believe that or not? A child's health in childbearing has and always will be in the hands of our Lord. Is the woman's health any excuse to either have or have not children to choose one or the other? I say it's, it's, it's not a proper excuse. You won't find a verse 
establishing that a woman has a right to choose based on her health. We serve a God who heals us. Any of these questions posed by the world have no standing or concern when faced with Scripture. In Luke, we read of Elizabeth's story and the birth of John. If you would please turn to, to Psalms 127. Psalms 127. I encourage you to read the story of Elizabeth and the birth of John. Uh, it's, it's a blessing in terms of the Lord bringing the conception, the Lord having His hand. Well, let's read the whole psalm because it's, it's only five verses. Psalm 127, one familiar with. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrow, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Verse 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with enemies in the gate. Notice if you would... Verse 3, I'm going to say, children equal reward. And now comes in, what are we going to do? You've got the choice, the medical choice, whatever you want to call it, few children equals few reward. Wait for it. Many. <laughs> Equal. Many rewards. Take your pick. Again, children are not the only reward we receive of the Lord. But I tell you what, if you want the manifold blessing, get those kids going. And Amen. It's, it's yeah. a blessed thing. And I know no one disagrees with this, but I hope to strengthen your, your faith and to give you some, some, some working material to take out into the world. Let's move on to, to, to chapter... Uh, 128, just the next chapter. The, and the, the heading under over, over above my chapter says, The God-fearing family. Verse 1, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord that walketh in his ways. Verse 2, For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands, happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Verse 3, Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants around thy table. Behold, that thus shall be the man... Shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord? The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Verse 6, Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon Israel. Let's consider a very interesting analogy in verse 3. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thy house, thy children like olive plants round about thy table. We know very simply, vines create wine. The finished product of vines is wine. The finished product of olives is oil. oil. Consider seconds. with me, if you will, all of the arguments that go on through a bachelor's mind, an, un, uh, an unmarried young man looking at his financial future, and he says to himself, well, I got my job squared away, and I can make pretty good money. I can progress and make more money as the years go on. But if I get married, she's going to cost me some money. You know, there's, a financial, you know, there's a financial, you know, responsibility there. And you can, you can add that up. You can do your little spreadsheet. You can make a spreadsheet of it. If he says, if I don't have to pay for a wife, I'll be a little bit farther ahead. Now, let's say that the, 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 the man and woman get married, but they look at their financial situation and say, if we don't have children, we can do a whole lot better in our finances 10, 20 years down the road. We'll be able to put a lot more into retirement, do a lot more stuff, have a lot more toys, newer cars, maybe here and there. But we can't do that if we have children. But now consider this. In terms of, uh, in terms of wine and oil, the man who does not put his faith in God would rather take his finances and invest in vats of wine as an investment, which was a proper investment in those days. The rich man had many vats of wine 
or lambskins, whatever you were, and barrels of oil. Each time he had some money, he would invest in more oil. And he would create a storehouse of wine, which was a commodity, as well as oil. And perhaps in his old age, he might be able to sell one or the other, as it were, and that would be his social security. His, his retirement would be in this investment that he could look at, that he could count, that he could touch, and that he could see. But notice, the wife is not to be as wine there available uh, that, that, that you can produce money from somehow. You know, maybe she could go get a job and be part of the, the earning income of the family. Your children are not to be oil that is a commodity. But notice, the wife is to be a vine, and the children are to be olive plants. Now, here we go. You can get <coughs> wine. How much wine can you get from a vine? It is continuous. Notice that. Your children are not simply vats of oil, and once you sell the oil, it's gone. Your children are olive plants that are continually creating, through the seasons, more oil. Do you notice the long-term view that it takes in order to look at a vine and say, I see profit in that vine. I see potential in that vine. It's not instantaneous money, but you, you have the vine that gives multiple barrels. Not just the one barrel that you were able to save up to purchase. It's going to keep on giving. How blessed is a wife that continually blesses her family. How blessed is it to have many children that contribute to the family. After a child's you know, in the, if we were to develop it, as the child becomes the tree, and you have 12 olive trees now producing, the wealth of the family increases. Not just simply barrels of oil worth what they are, but you have an increasing value consistently. Season by season, you would progress. Plant more trees. Get more olives. And the value of the family goes up. That is how we are to view a wife and children. Not simply if I don't have those, I can purchase my wine and my oil, but rather the family is seen as increasing the value of the family. Do you see that? Simply on a, on a, just in an analogy. The world will always tell us one thing, and Scripture will probably always tell us another. See, the, the, the difference in world views just in that analogy right there. Imagine the blessing of a godly society, which we hope to reconstruct through God's law and His Word, in which couples, young, young men and women, are encouraged to marry and encouraged to have as many children as they can. Olive plants creating uh, worth within the kingdom of God. Uh, if you would please turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Verses like this that will put you right on track. So we, th we think we got it lined out. But verses like this just put a stop to the whole thing. Now here's the wicked advice. It is good stewardship to stop having children because you can't afford them. That's the wicked advice. What's the response? Philippians 4.19 But my God shall supply all your need, physically and spiritually, shall supply all the need according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. Through and only through Jesus Christ, our Lord will supply our needs. You can't argue with that financial statement right there. You can't touch it. Well, unless you don't believe it. But I trust you do today. My God shall supply all your needs. Not your wants. As, um, I was reading a book. They say they don't make a nine-passenger Corvette yet, but maybe one day. <laughs> if you're a big family, you can want a Corvette. You're probably not going to get it. You need the, 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 the joy bus, right? <laughs> the there you go. So supply all of your needs. Two kids, ten kids, 19 kids, the Lord will supply that need. Don't talk to me of, oh, it's, it, we're too poor. There's a financial problem. Any problem, Scripture overcomes it. Any reason or excuse to not have children or to stop having children is not 
a biblical one. You can come up with your excuse, but it's not a biblical one. Some might say, we knew from the Lord that we were to have three children. The Lord told us it was three. Ah, I'm not going to buy that. Or by not having children, three. here's another excuse. And, and I say to you, that's just emotionalism. They wanted to stop at three, so now they're using the Lord as their excuse. The Lord doesn't, the Lord, that's contradictory. The Lord doesn't work that way. He told, he told me and every one of you, be fruitful and multiply. Don't tell me the Lord told you to stop at three. <laughs> and uh, that seems easy to me. Yeah. By, not, by not having children, we're able to have more time and more, more uh, you know, money that we can put towards ministry in the church. Isn't that a good thing to be, you know, we, we have more time, we have our evenings free to minister in the church. If a husband and wife are married, they are to have a proper physical relationship, and woe to them if they dare close the womb simply so they can have a ministry. That's, again, that's a, a, again contradictory to the way our Lord would have it. There's a, a, a little term here that I'll introduce you to. This is, this is from a book I read. Dad gave me a book three. Does anybody know what a dink is? A dink? It is a dual income. Dual income. No kids. No kids. Look at that. We've got dinks all over the place. They're you, they're, they're 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 earning two incomes, but they don't have any kids. And I ask you, in terms of the blessing we're talking about from Deuteronomy, and would I have been better off with Jenna? Send her off to work. Me get the landscaping going. We'd be in Disneyland, we'd have a new car, we might have AC in the car. Who's to say? <laughs> Who is no kids? Imagine that. that we, Jenna gave up AC when she married me, I'll be honest. Yep. Yeah. Good oh, women wow. do. We got a car. <laughs> Dual income, no kids. Imagine that. Is that where you want to head? Is that where you, is that where you would encourage people you know to be? Dual income, but no kids. But do can anyone here, can anyone give me an amen that they know someone who perhaps has this mindset? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dual income, but no kids. If you would, Psalm, Psalm 37. Psalm 37. We're fighting this mentality this morning. Fighting that. Psalm 37, verse 25 and 26. Psalm 37, verse 25. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Verse 26. He is ever merciful, and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. It's a daunting thing, heading into this world, bearing bearing children, and Jenna and I are, are in that season of our life, and it's a very daunting thing looking forward, one kid, two kids, we'll keep going, but boy, Lord, where's the money going to come from? There's a cost to everything, to diapers, more food, clothes, where's it all going to come from? He says, I have been old, been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken. That's, that's the financial statement you can take to the bank. He'll supply all my needs, and, he, and, and David has not seen the righteous forsaken. That doesn't mean 20 bucks. That doesn't mean $2,000. We think on those terms, but the righteous are not forsaken, nor his seed baking bread. That can, that can get me to sleep at night. When I know there's a bill coming up to be paid, right? And, you know, and everybody here's been in, you know, been that young married couple, right? Boy, that 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 can rest your mind. There's peace in that verse for the young married couple wondering how are we gonna make it through. The tranny's about to go out. How are we gonna get it fixed? The righteous have not been forsaken, nor the seed begging bread. After reading the verses of where babies truly come from, what woman throughout history would actually be given permission by our Lord to alter her body and thwart his natural process? It is our Lord that gives conception. How in the world would he give permission to a woman to perhaps be sterilized, to stop 
is natural process. It's contradictory and hence invalid, and yet there's a world fighting for women to become sterile. There's a whole world of it out there. There's books, articles, and, and the church was pushing for it, for women to stop having children. All married women, here's the statement for today, and label me however you will, but I hope it's a biblicist. All married women are to have babies as soon and as often as they are blessed. And all married women are to have babies soon and as often as they are blessed. There's, there, I don't, from the verses, that's the conclusion you must come to. It must be your conclusion from Scripture. All husbands are to work to provide for the family, to teach, to train, and protect their families, no matter how large or small. I'm not going to get into you that the biblical pattern is for approximately five to six, uh, ten uh, in some cases. I'm not going numbers. I'm saying duty is ours. Results are God's. In his providence, he could give us the two we have now, Jenna and I, the two we have now, and may put us in a five-year gap. I don't know. But duty is ours. Results are his. And we'll be at peace, and we will rest in him. Now you might say, yes, as many and as often, but can you draw any other conclusion from Scripture itself? Our emotions might tell us one thing, but talk to me of Scripture. Now let's look at large families. I'd like to read a portion from this book. Dad uh, lent me this book to prepare for the sermon, A Full Quiver, an apt title. Let me read from page 148. Consider this. Check out these Bible statistics. If I'm saying as often and as many, <gasps> panic. Check out these Bible statistics, all from families that not only eschewed, that is, they did not like family planning, but actively desired children. Abraham and Sarah, one boy. Isaac and Rebecca, twins. Jacob and Rachel, two boys. Jacob and Leah, six boys and one girl. Whoa, that's big. Jacob and Bilhah, two boys. Jacob and Zilpah, two boys. Joseph and Asenath, two boys. Imagine that. These are families that cried unto the Lord for families. And they were granted, in His providence, one boy. Simply twins. The Lord can do what He would in the, in, in the, in the, the, the life of a woman. We don't need to be talking, you know, not every family in the Bible had 12 to 15. Our Lord grants that life. And I haven't even touched on the many objections. I'm sure if I ask the, the, the crowd today, the, what, you know, what objections have you heard against large families or for you know, people having babies? Any of the many objections to having large families. Here's a fun one. I can't spend enough quality time with ch 12 children. If I had 12 children, I wouldn't be able to spend enough quality time with them. But think of this. This is just a fun little one. Christ did. He had 12 spiritual children. They were babes in the Lord, and our Lord nurtured them and was faithful to train them. Now, it doesn't cross over very well, but at least I thought that was a great point. Christ was able to spend quality time with 12 different individuals and lead them. Can we do any less with our very own children? Now, we, know, we all know what the statistics are. I don't have them up here in terms of what is the average size family in America today. I think it's like 1.8 or something. The average the average American family size, it's lower in the church than outside the church, sadly enough. How late people start families. People are starting families, the late, you know, they're late 30s, early 40s, trying, you know, finally after their careers are rolling, then they're starting to have children. Those statistics are, are daunting. It's not looking good out there for the church. But the two questions we began with, how many children? This is to you. How many children should a family have? How many? I ask, how many do you have? Is there a disconnect? If there is, if there is a disconnect, there is repentance. And there is forgiveness. If perhaps you, you have erred, then I'm, you know, don't, don't raise your hand. I'm not pointing a finger. But let's get this right. Let's get our theology in line. Then let's encourage some young people to have children. Are there solutions to this problem? I'm giving you a problem. Our society hates large families. Our society basically hates children. Is there a solution? I say you 
can support any young couple or family currently having or raising children. Become, as it were, godparents. Be active in the life of a young family. Uh, my parents are blessings to Jenna and I in that they can take Warren Lee for an evening when Jenna and I go make a grocery run. They're supporting our childbearing. Right. They support it. Can, is there a role you can fill in the life? If you're past childbearing age, is there a role you can fill by helping out a young couple? Uh, think of the possibilities of that ministry alone for those who, who, who are not to have any more children due to age or that sort of thing, or perhaps a, a wrong decision. Can you do something to help a young family? Believe me, we're beset upon. We can use all the help we can get. Consider that as a ministry. We send money to missionaries to the children in foreign lands, and, and truly there is work to be done there as well. Nothing, nothing is seen to be weird in that. You're sending money off to missionaries, but find a family. Perhaps pledge them a hundred bucks a month to keep having children. Say, I know she has four children, and they're a beautiful family. I'll give you a hundred bucks to have a fit. <laughs> Do it. Uh, that, that, that's a valid hundred bucks a month. That's in the key. That's key to investment right there. A, a Christian family, as it were, with, with children. Uh, you know, don't get me wrong there. Bless a young family. Young families can use all the blessing they can get. Um, in the book, it asks the question: Consider it, but don't ever answer. Would you rather have a million dollars? Or one more child. One more child. Oh, my money's looking good. But one more child. Man, would you would you do it for ten grand? Would you rather you know how, how low does the amount have to go? But would you trade one or the other? And that you know, it's scary to think of what we would do in our own selfishness and our own emotion. Oh, you're blessed in already large family at Christmas time or for birthday gifts. There's ministry out there. There's Room for ministry. Encourage anyone you know to have many children. Young couples ready, starting out. Train your children at home now to have many children. Take them to the Bible and say, this is why. You have the material now. You have the verses behind you to say the Bible demands consistency in childbearing. Now, the Lord will bring the conception. He'll bring the children. Duty is ours. Results are God's. Now, I'm going to go back to the book. Let's have fun just for a second. And I hope you'll enjoy this. In terms of large families, we say, oh, you, you know, it's two or three is the best. Two or three is the maximum. Maybe four if they're really rich or really smart. They deserve a couple extra. But watch this. <laughs> Here it comes. Beethoven, as we know, not, you know, Beethoven of history, should never have been allowed to be born. His family story is amazing. Ludwig's father had contracted syphilis and his mother tuberculosis. Their first child was born blind. Baby number two died. Deafness was the lot of number three, and the fourth child had his mother's illness, tuberculosis. Now that's enough to make most people quit. How much faith do you have to go past that? You've got blind, deaf, died, and a, and a baby with tuberculosis. It wasn't enough in this case for the fifth child was Ludwig von Beethoven. The next time you're singing, joyful, joyful, we adore thee, in your hymnal, he wrote the music, but not the words, be grateful the elder Beethovens had Ludwig. Imagine that. Any one of us would have said, oh, you can stop at four. Boy, that was a, you know, a train wreck. They had the fifth. Turns out to be Beethoven. Next in this mis missing musicians list is one who is considered by many to have been the greatest Italian tenor ever. He was the 18th of 21 children. The fact that the first 17 died at or very near childbirth only augments the wonder of Enrico Caruso's birth. By the way, according to a biographer of Caruso's life, there was only one girl in all 21 births. Imagine that. 17 died <coughs> near or around childbirth. And yet the 18th was Enrico Caruso, and he ended up having uh, three siblings. Imagine those numbers, 17 deaths, and yet they, they, they tried for the 18th. How many young couples in America, with our stamina and backbone, which we're lacking, would, would have done that? 
and that we're in, we're in bad shape. George Washington, in terms of children, well, the children in a large family don't get that quality time. You know, they'll, they, they, they can't be nurtured properly. They'll never end up to anything. Large families are simply dumb kids. George Washington was the fifth of ten. How many knew that? George Washington. So if you want to say they won't add up to much, coming from <laughs> ten kids, he was the fifth. He was in the middle of ten kids. Thomas Jefferson had ten children. He had a large family. James Madison had 12 children. Let me see if I got one more. Uh, John, president, the 10th president of the United States, John Tyler, presided over the largest family. He had 15 kids. President of the, of the, of the United States had 15 kids. Sylvanus Crosby, paternal grandfather of Fanny Crosby, 19th of 19. There's 19 kids. We've got the, the Duggars, which are an amazing testimony for us in America today. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was the eighth child in his family. Jonathan Edwards was the eleventh of eleven. Jonathan Edwards, if they had quit at seven, eight, you know, two or three, we wouldn't have had Jonathan Edwards. Charles Finney was the seventh. Dwight L. Moody was sixth of eight. Cornelius Van Til, sixth of eight. Ulrich Zwingli, third of ten. Imagine if the testimony of America today, two or three kid maximum, or of Japan and, and China, well, only one. We would never have had those men. And who can deny or say, well, you know, kids from large families just are, you know, they don't get that time to be brought up properly. These are world leader, national leaders who either came from large families or had large families themselves. Is there any reason good enough to defy the word of God itself? Perhaps peer pressure. I can't, I can't, I can't obey the Bible. The Bible's right, but I can't obey it because man, I got so much peer pressure going on. Is there a good enough reason? Is health a good enough reason to de defy the Word of God? Finances, are they a good enough reason? Individual revelation. Oh, the Lord told us to stop at so many. Is that a reason to defy Scripture itself? Perhaps we know better than God. He doesn't. He just. The Lord didn't know about modern America, and so we, we, we need to change a few things. Not all, family, not all families will be large. Not all Christian families will be large. Not everyone will be married. But Scripture is once again clear. Duty is ours, results our God's. I hope you've seen today a biblical consideration of the fruit of of the womb. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I ask that your word would truly be in our hearts, that we might seek and follow it with every breath that we take. So Lord, where we have erred, may we, may we repent and seek forgiveness. And Lord, where we find ministry and opportunity, may we surge forward with energy, with a renewed sense of obligation and responsibility, and to bless those around us. So, Father, we ask that our hearts would be pure, and that we would follow you with everything that is within us. In your name we pray. Amen.